hands. God bless you. I don't uh, normally drink while I'm speaking, but it's good to <laughs> have a little thirst. If I were in Russia today, I would be saying, Jesus was Christ. Jesus is risen. Uh, we know he's risen, but he could only rise from the dead because he had to die first. And I want to turn you to the scripture, to the word of God. And the scripture that I'm going to begin with today is in 1 Corinthians 15. And this is a very simple declaration. But I believe this declaration is where we begin. Verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which you have received and wherein you stand, by which also you were saved, if you keep in memory what was preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sin according to the prof prophecy of Scripture, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scripture, and was seen alive by many. So the very basis of our gospel is based on three things, all in Corinthians. Christ died, he rose again, and he's coming again. And that's the basis of our faith. And, you know, it's very interesting, this week I, I, I had to participate in an unusual festival, and it was to do with the 102nd anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic. <laughs> now, I know I'm into boats and sailing, but I'm not into sinking boats. <laughs> but the fact is that the reason that I was there and the reason for this celebration is quite unusual. Firstly, one of the most famous men from the sinking of the Titanic lived in Dewsbury. And he was the bandmaster who is famed for having played Nearer My God to Thee as the ship went down. Uh, it is known that none of the bandsmen survived, but after two weeks after the sinking, they discovered the body of the bandmaster whose name is Wallace Hartley. And strapped to his body was the violin which he'd played. Now, why am I talking about this? I'm talking about it uh, for a very simple reason. Now, they had a celebration on Wednesday, which was, sorry, Tuesday, which was the 102nd anniversary. Now, we were celebrating something, but it was not only the deaths of 1,517 people on the ship, but we were celebrating the memory of someone who did something extremely brave. The celebration was in Dewsbury because he was from Dewsbury. And I was there because my granddaughter was asked to take part. <laughs> and granddad has to be there. But it seemed quite significant when I discovered the story and they recovered the violin. It disappeared and a few years ago reappeared. Somebody had had it, somebody had bought it, somebody had kept it. And last year, only a matter of months ago, that violin, which was just, it wasn't a Stradivarius, it was just an ordinary one bought for this bandmaster Wallace Hartley by his fiancée. And so it had his initials in it. It went up 
it was paraded in Dewsbury last year. I didn't see it. It went up for auction. And to my utter astonishment, when I looked it up on the internet, this simple, ordinary violin was sold for just under one million pounds. Nine, over 900,000. And I, I'm just astonished that something which is just a mere, what is it, at the end of the day, a waterlogged violin which can't even be played, but just in memory of the bravery of a man who, and it was a wonderful thing to do when the ship was going down not to save his life, but, and when they, apparently he'd, he was a Christian, He'd been grown up in the church, knew the hymn, Nearer My God to Thee, and the band struck up that song. After all, what a, a moment. But you know, when thinking that something from one man, so, so simple, yet can be worth so much money, and yet here we are with remembering today the death of Jesus, Oh, yes, uh, they, they spent a lot of money, as you know. The mother of Constantine, the Roman emperor, spent money trying to find the cross. And if you go somewhere, I'm sure sooner or later you'll come against somebody who's got a relic of the cross. But I don't think it's the original one anyway. <laughs> I, I, I know that there's an awful lot of argument over the Shroud of Turin which is supposedly the shroud in which they buried him. I don't think it's the original one anyway, <laughs> because it's a little bit like the robe of Mohammed the prophet. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in Istanbul. I've been there 20 or 30 times. And when I go there, I love to go to the Topkapi Museum. And in that museum, they've got the robe of the prophet Mohammed. And me being a little bit of a you know, I like a little bit of a joke sometimes. And so I used to go up to the curator of this museum, well, who had the key to this gold chest. And I used to say to him, oh, come on, let's open it. I don't believe the, the prophet's robe is in there, you know, after 1,400 years. Come on, it can't be there. I said, open it up, let's have a look. <laughs> and so inevitably his reply was always the same. He said, I can't open it, because if I open it, the air will turn it to dust. Yes, so that's the truth. There's nothing in it but dust. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, with Jesus Christ, it's different. He died, but he rose again. And the miracle of Jesus is not just his death, but his life. And he's, he was seen alive. It lists the people who saw him physically. I don't need to read it. You can read yourself. But the fact is, we know him. We don't talk to a dead prophet, a dead God. We're talking to a living Christ, a living Savior. And thank God that you can rent this building, but you're aware of what's up there on the wall behind me because I was looking at it carefully from the back. It's the crucifix. This is Catholic school. But the fact is this, that I don't want to be forever looking at a dead body on a cross. What we've got is an empty cross and an empty tomb because Christ is risen. And you know, this brings us to some of the real questions and real problems because, yes, we can have a memorial of death, and significantly, if you're into football, you know that the very day when I was there at the bandstand in Dewsbury remembering the Titanic, people were filling the football stadium in memory of Hillsborough 25 years ago. And of course, if you watch the news this morning, as I did briefly, with the sinking of that ferry in South Korea, what struck me was because of the stormy weather, for two days they couldn't get into the hull, but today they've got into the hull. And they found nobody alive. 
And you see, this is a tragedy. You go to a grave. You go, and sadly, and I can't speak lightly of, of what's happened in Korea. What a tragedy that they weren't warned. The ship was sinking and the children were told to keep their places and not to move instead of telling them to quickly get to their exits and get out 300 young children. Well, what, 16, 17-year-old children dead? I understand the grief. But you know, the difference is, and I was only thinking as I, I saw that finally the divers had been able to get into the hull, but there's nobody alive. And you know, if you to go to the grave of Christ, nobody's empty. It's not a, a memorial to the dead. We don't want to look at that. We want to find the living Christ. And we want to rejoice in the living Christ and in the power of God and in the power of the gospel. But you know, if we're going to celebrate something today, I, I want to be a little bit unusual because I want to say that we can celebrate death. Now, that may sound unusual. No, normally, it's a time of mourning. But for us, it's a time of celebration. Because if I turn you to another scripture, and if I turn you briefly to Romans... What you find is this in Romans 6. It's talking about death. It starts off by saying, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How can we that are dead to sin live in that sin? Don't you know, this is Romans 6, verse 3, don't you know that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? You know, the first time that I was ever called on to preach uh, at a water baptism service other than ones that I was holding was 40 years ago in Hungary, in the communist area, I had a lot of freedom there, and I was preaching. And I remember I was asked to be the speaker at a baptismal service where they were baptizing young people. Well, for me, I, I, I'm so used to water baptism. I baptize so many people. I've been baptized myself. But I thought, look, these are young people in Hungary. And I began to look into some of the scripture on it, and I preached on it. To me, it was just an ordinary message. That was the end of it. But do you know... They'd never heard preaching like that on water baptism. And all the young people were asking for copies of, of, of what I had said. And actually, when I met one of the pastors who was there 40 years after, 40 years after that baptismal service, do you know what he said to me? David, he said, do you remember that baptismal service? I never forgot what you said. He said, I tried to repeat what you said time and time again. I've attended baptismal services in Israel. I baptized people in the Jordan. I, 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 yes, but I remember the last time I was at a baptismal service and I wasn't conducting it. And it was an evangelical pastor who was baptizing somebody, somebody I know. But you know, to me, the strange thing was, he never really mentioned the truth of what water baptism is about. To me, I believe we can celebrate the death of Jesus, but celebrate in a different way. I believe that you can celebrate death, because you know, I'm a dead man. I hope you know that. <laughs> You know, people look at me and your pastor said, oh, you look younger. <laughs> no, I'm dead. <laughs> I am dead and buried. Well, that's what it says here. Know you not that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Don't you know that we are buried with him in baptism? Like just as Christ was raised from the dead, so we come up out of the water into new life. So our water baptism isn't just a testimony. It is literally the death of the old nature, the old man beset by the devil and tempted by the devil. It's dead. And devil, you can't touch me. I'm dead. Hallelujah. So I'm rejoicing. Oh, praise God, I'm a dead man. <laughs> But I've come to life. 
because just as Jesus came out of the grave, so I rose from the water. And the Bible says, when I rose from the water, it was symbolic and participating in the resurrection of Christ. So the resurrection of Christ is part of you and part of me. I'm part of physical, literally, absolutely. Oh, how can I say it? I'm part of the resurrection. Isn't that wonderful? So to me, I'm celebrating today. Celebrating death. Because there's life after death. Oh, hallelujah. And if you read on... Oh, Paul says, yes, he that is dead is free from sin. If we be dead with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dies no more, death has no more dominion over him. Likewise, ye yourselves are dead unto sin and alive unto God through Jesus Christ. The death of the old, the life of the new. But you know, this is a tremendous challenge. And what I'm finding today particularly is the death and resurrection is a miracle. Mm -hmm. It's a miracle. And I believe in miracles. Oh, hallelujah, I believe in miracles. Everything about God, everything about Jesus is a miracle. And what I find when I'm dealing with a number of different religions and at the moment beginning to work a little bit in the UK in this, one of the hardest things, even for religion, is to accept miracles. I know there are some churches that won't have me preach. Because, oh, David believes in miracles, he prays for the sick, miracles happen. And they're afraid when David's not here, <laughs> they'll expect the miracles to go on. Of course we do. You see, everything about our faith is a miracle. Everything about Jesus is a miracle. His birth, it's a miracle. His death, it's a miracle. His resurrection, it's a miracle. God created the world, it's a miracle. They're still trying to discover how man create, oh, how scientists created the world. Well, not quite. They've discovered the Big Bang, they've discovered all sorts of things. But the fact is, we know God made the world. But it takes faith to believe in miracles. Without faith, you have no miracles. If you've got miracles, you need faith. And you know, the whole thing about our Christian faith is, our Christian faith is based on the miraculous. And you know, when I look back at my life, virtually the whole of my life has been, <laughs> what, designated, created, uh, formed by miracles. Almost everything I do involves a miracle. In fact, for me, this Easter is a double celebration. No, a tri triple celebration, let's get it right. <laughs> At Easter, I'm celebrating three things. The death and resurrection of Christ, like you. I'm also celebrating my release from prison. And quite significantly, I'm celebrating my birthday. <laughs> you see, Easter means so much to me because when I was in that communist prison, you all know the story, but let me give it a little bit of the background. Uh, what's it, 40 years? Yeah, 40, 42 years ago when I was put in that prison, communist prison, uh, in the difficult days, and you know, the interesting thing about my prison experience is, I have no idea, I, I see it only from my side of the miracle. But a few months ago, we were contacted by a Czechoslovak historian. He's secular, he's not a Christian, and uh, he was researching modern Czech history and he was covering the period when the communists were controlling Czechoslovakia and the period immediately after. And he came across my story because I was in prison in Czechoslovakia. So he contacted us, uh, wanted to meet me, was excited that I was still alive, and so came to do an interview with me. He's going to write a book about me. 
well, I'll be part of it anyway. And she said, do you know, he said, when I began to research your story, as a historian would do, he said, I came across in London an enormous file on you. Mm -hmm. And because my name is Hathaway, do you know what the name of the file is down at the home office or wherever they keep it? Shakespeare. <laughs> because, you know, I'm related to Shakespeare's wife, Anne Hathaway. <laughs> so with some sense of humor, the file is called Shakespeare. And he said, I'm absolutely amazed when I looked into the background. He said, there you were, shut up in a communist prison. The British government was doing nothing to get you out. The Russians, and it wasn't the Czechs, it was the Russians who had insisted on my imprisonment because I had Russian Bibles. The Russians didn't want to release me, but there was an enormous political argument going on. And this was involved in part of the file because it was all to do with what was known as the Helsinki Accord, where the Western nations were trying to persuade Russia on behalf of the communists to sign an agreement to uh, support freedom of religion, freedom of faith, and freedom from persecution. And this historian is saying, David, he said, you don't seem to realize you were in the middle of this battle. And why my case suddenly became much greater significance than just me was because he said, when I research it, and this is the reason for the file, he said, the Western nations were arguing over freedom of religion. The Russians were arguing over freedom of religion. But the Western nation that Britain left you in the prison. They're arguing about freedom, but they're not bothered about you. The Russians are arguing about freedom. They're not bothered about David Hathaway in the prison. And so there I was in the middle of the case, and the whole thing involved, my imprisonment involved the whole argument over this freedom of religion. Finally, the Russians signed it. But, you know, you suddenly realize there's much more to this story than you realize. But to me in that prison, what happened? Why? Well, uh, I, I was in there for nearly a year. I should have been there for 10 years. You know the story. Five years for Bible smuggling, five years for preaching the gospel. And uh, I was taken for trial, brought before the court. They found me guilty, uh, not of Bible smuggling, not of tax evasion. What did they find me guilty of? The content of the Bible. They, and I said, what's wrong with the Bible? They said it attacks the state. So I, I was actually arrested and accused and imprisoned on sedition. And if you look at the story of Jesus, why was he sentenced to death? Here we are remembering his death. Why? Why did he die? He was taken before a court and accused of sedition. And he was crucified on that charge. So if you understand, it's an indefensible charge. The kingdom of God. We're not of this kingdom, we're of the kingdom of God. We're not of this world, we're of God's world. We're God's kingdoms. We're strangers here, we're pilgrims here. We're going to a promised land. We own Jesus Christ as Lord, not David Cameron, Jesus. And the politicians can argue over their politics and they can argue over, thank God David Cameron is now coming out in favor of religion and Christianity. And what excites me, he's talking about evangelical faith. Wow. <laughs> and he said we should share that faith and spread that faith. We should. <laughs> but you see, the whole thing comes down to the question of miracles and faith. And you know, at the moment, uh, well, when, when, when I was young and was hungry for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and finally received, oh, well, I was going to tell you the story about getting out of prison first. <laughs> the, 
the miracle of my getting out of prison, and this is why it's connected with today, the miracle of my getting out of prison was that God showed me in a dream two days after my trial, when I'd been found guilty, sentenced to what would have been at least 10 years in prison, uh, possibly the way they were talking, they wanted to kill me in there, that's what they always said, you'll never get out alive. And so, when I was found guilty and sentenced, you know, the utter despair of that moment. I, I had already seen one young Czech fellow it brought into my cell, and the reason he'd come into the cell, this was before my trial, the reason that he'd come in is he'd been arrested. He did something incredibly stupid. He was trying to escape from Czechoslovakia. He was a, 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 a soldier, and he was one of the border guards, and he thought, I know how to get across this border, and uh, what he did was he went home, took his rifle home, and uh, then he got ready, set off. To get back to the border, he hijacked a car at gunpoint. What a stupid thing to do. <laughs> the result was <laughs> that he got arrested and put in prison. And then uh, his cellmates said to him, what on earth were you going to do if you got freedom and escaped to the West? What could you do? You've got no money. How, how, how would you manage? Oh, he said, I, I was going to make a lot of money. He said, I know where all the rocket sites are with the rockets that are targeted at the West. He said, I will sell this information to the West and they will give me money and everything is fine. So one of his cellmates turned to him and said, oh, rubbish, how do you know where those sites are? And the stupid fellow drew a map. <laughs> so, of course, he was back in court, <laughs> not only for attempting to escape, but for betraying government secrets. He was sentenced to 20 years, and immediately afterwards he was put in my cell. And we had the job of trying to comfort him and keep him from committing suicide or whatever. And I'll never forget the, the terrible atmosphere in my cell with that young fellow who, because of his own stupidity, had ended up with, what, an 18-year-old boy, ended up with a 20-year sentence and the knowledge it was unlikely he would get out even after 20 years. But you see, it was in that atmosphere that when I was sentenced, and I knew that the sentence would be carried out, there's no remission for good conduct in these prisons. I knew that what they were doing was already preparing further charges against me, and that this business of my preaching the gospel in the prison was a further accusation, again, that they were going to keep me, and keep me, and keep me. And so, that night, after the trial, I, I, I was in some shock. I had expected to be released. I'd expected to be set free. And it was in that that two days later, I had that amazing dream. And in the dream, I saw myself out of the prison in London, yeah, here in London, and I was in the Royal Albert Hall. And at that time, the Elim churches that I belonged to, Every Easter Monday had a big rally with 10,000 people in the Royal Albert Hall. They don't do it now. And I saw myself in the Royal Albert Hall preaching. And I said, oh God, this is impossible on two counts. One is, nobody knows me, I'm an unknown Bible smuggler. And secondly, I've just been sentenced to up to 10 years in prison. But I began to pray into it. And I began to lay hold of it. And after nine months in the prison, the one impossible thing happened. I, I was forbidden to have a Bible, but as you know, I'm a professional smuggler. <laughs> I don't know why you asked me to preach here, I'm a confessed criminal. <laughs> and as a result of being a professional, I was able to smuggle my Bible back into my cell. 
and I became the only person in the 6,000 in the prison with a Bible. Well, what's the point of being a smuggler if you can't do that? <laughs> I was in prison for smuggling Bibles, wasn't I? And I smuggled uh, tons and hundreds of tons of Bibles for 20 years, if I can't, for 12 years. If I can't get one in my own cell, that's... that's uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> So when I got it and I began to read, and I didn't know where to start reading. If you've been without your Bible for nine months, where do you start? Do you start in Genesis? Do you start in Matthew? Do you start in Revelation? And there's me thinking, Bible, where do I start? And somehow the Holy Spirit said to me, hmm, your name's David. Why don't you read what David says? He had enough troubles, didn't he? <laughs> he might be king, but he had a lot of troubles. Start and read what he says. So I began reading David, you know, in the Psalms, and came to Psalm 35, verse 18. What does it say? David says, I will give God praise, just like you're doing. I will give God praise in the great congregation. I jumped up and down. Hallelujah. God says, the great congregation, Royal Albert Hall, Easter Monday, I'm going home. Uh-huh. So, after these months, that was five months, six months after my trial, suddenly I had concrete evidence in writing. And you know, you sing that wonderful song. What is it? God has spoken. Let the church say, Amen. <laughs> and that's me believing that in faith before I heard the song. You know, you believe in faith before you hear. Thank you. <laughs> and there's me rejoicing and saying, right, God says, I will give God thanks for my release in the Royal Albert Hall on Easter Monday. Mm -hmm. It's just coming. It's just coming, isn't it? Three days. But now I wasn't satisfied because I'll tell you why in a moment. I wasn't satisfied. I said, oh God, if you can send me home for Easter, look, when I'm condemned to 10 years in this filthy, stinking prison, and by the way, the, 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 the Russian Jews think my prison was worse than the Holocaust, and it probably was, but I, I've not been in the Holocaust, I've only been in the other. And if you want to know why I preach to sinners, if hell is worse than my prison cell, God help you. <laughs> I'll say that to any sinner. If hell is worse than my prison, you better cry out to God for forgiveness. And there I was. I said, oh God, if you can work a miracle so big that you can get me out of this prison, and not only out of the prison, but have me in the, an unknown Bible smuggler in the Royal Albert Hall preaching, wow! Wow! That's a miracle. And if you can do that, then I said, oh God, why don't you do a bigger miracle? Now, I'm, I'm not like you, you see. I'm just a cheeky Englishman. <laughs> and I said, oh God, if you can work that miracle, why can't you work a bigger one? My birthday comes four days before Easter. Send me home for my birthday. But because I wanted the evidence, I said, if you will do it, I want to know now. Okay? I'm impatient. Ask my staff. I'm impatient. I couldn't wait. I said, I want the answer now. And I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, if you can do this second miracle, show me another verse in the Psalms where you talk about releasing a prisoner who's in chains. I didn't know if there's anything like that. I read on. The first answer was in Psalm 35, verse 18. I read on, I think it's Psalm 63, I forget now, I think it's Psalm 63, verse 6. And there it is, God puts the prisoner in families and he brings out those who are in chains. That was the exact verse. So I said, oh, hallelujah, I'm going home on my birthday. And the miracle is, God did exactly that. As you know, the Prime Minister flew to Czechoslovakia 
and on my birthday, I flew home with Harold Wilson in that plane, and because of the publicity of Harold Wilson, I was invited to speak in the Royal Albert Hall on Easter Monday. But you see, that was to color the whole of my life. Because what I found out, what God says he does. And you know, when I prayed over so many crises, when I was praying over the, my lung cancer 11 years ago, 12 years ago, it was Psalm 89 that struck me. And it says in verse 20, I found David my son. Oh, oh, it's my name again, sorry. And with my holy oil, I've anointed him. And then in verse 33, Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. 34, Psalm 89, verse 34, write it on your shirt so that it won't wash out. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Once have I sworn, sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to any single believer in this church in Croydon. No, to David. <laughs> God says, I will not lie. I will not change my covenant. What I've said, I will do. And you know, the whole basis of our faith is on this. Now, coming to the other thing I was trying to tell you was, when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, having been brought up in a Pentecostal church, and my father having been the general superintendent, I suppose I was brought up with a lot of good teaching. But the fact was, I knew that when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, is it 11, 12, 13, it says this, it says, cover the best gifts. And the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, as you know, they can be divided into three groups of three. There's the vocal gifts, speaking with tongues, the translation of tongues, and prophecy. There are three intellectual gifts, the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, and uh, discerning of spirits. And there are three practical gifts. And they are the gifts of faith, the working of miracles, gifts of healing. And you know, of all the gifts, the one gift that I've sought God for all my life, more than any other, is the gift of faith. The gift of faith. And you know, almost everything that happens in my life is based on faith. And you know, when I think about Jesus going into the cross, you know, can you imagine? Here is the world's greatest evangelist, son of God, here on earth, with power to heal the sick, raise the dead, work miracles, and do such mighty things greater than anybody can do until the present generation. And he knows that after three and a half years of ministry, he has got a dog. And you know, the whole of his disciples, his followers, rebelled against his death. They prophesied against it. They tried to stop him going to Jerusalem. They said, if you go, you'll be killed. Don't go. And everything you see about that early church, you look at those early disciples, the whole intent was stop him going. And the reason that Judas betrayed him, and I'm shocked that Judas, who was chosen as one of the twelve, would betray him. And yet the significant thing is, why did he betray him? He betrayed him for this reason. He was the treasurer. He had the money. And he believed that Jesus was going to be the king, the Messiah, and rule Israel and get rid of the Romans. And when he finally heard that Jesus was actually going to die, he lost everything. All his hope, all his future was gone. He put everything on Jesus, becoming the king, the, the, the one who would overthrow the Romans, and he went out and betrayed him in shock. But you know, even the other 12 disciples, the other 11, 
had the same thought. Because you know when Jesus said to them in Acts chapter 1 after the resurrection, wait in Jerusalem till you be endued with power, you, and these signs will follow those that believe. You know what the disciples said to him? Do you know the first thing they said? When the Holy Spirit comes, will you restore the kingdom to Israel? So their minds, their thoughts were on this. But you see, Jesus knew when he died, he knew that he would rise again. And he died in absolute faith. And you know, when you come into the Christian life, you are saved by faith. And just don't get away from it. You are saved by faith. Faith in the death of Christ. Faith in the forgiveness of sin. Faith in the resurrection. And even when you're baptized, you're baptized in faith, knowing that you're going to come up the other side alive. And the whole of our Christian life is based on faith. Faith in miracles. Faith in the power of God. Faith in what God can do. And you know, I've always said, oh God, give me the gift of faith. I'm always pleading, oh God, give me that gift of faith. But I'll tell you something very interesting. I've had to live by faith. I, I, I was sharing just before the meeting, and you know, this to me is one of the most amazing things. The house that I live in, I live in a nice house. How did I get that house? When God healed my throat cancer, and I had said, Lord, if you want me to leave my church, give up my salary and go to Russia, work a miracle, heal my throat cancer. That day, when God healed my throat cancer, I had to go back to my church and say, I'm leaving. I said, I'll work for three months while you get another pastor, but I won't even take a salary. From that moment, I refused to take another penny from the church. And what did I do? Oh dear, I went into poverty. I pleaded for help from the government. I, I, I approached Christians, can you help me? No, what did I do? I went out, I bought a piece of land, I built a house, and when I finished building the house, I then bought a tour bus, brand new, that cost twice as much as my house cost. Uh -huh. Uh huh. And I'd just given up my salary. <laughs> but you see, what I was determined to do was live by faith. But that didn't mean living in poverty. That didn't mean doing without. God said, go. And I was going to go. But I had to look after my family. I had to have a place somewhere for my family. And if I was going to be traveling, and of course it was a tour company and so on, I needed the new bus. And you know, today, and, I, and I'm quite shocked, and one reason why I'm talking like this is I'm facing the biggest challenge of my life. I'm being told by, not by the board, but I'm being told by my largest donor who came to, he was a businessman, he was in London, he came up to my office to see me and lectured me for three hours I then met him in Germany, and he lectured me for another three hours. He is German. And the whole thing he's saying is, David, you cannot live by faith anymore. He said, David, it's all right talking about living by faith if your mission was small, and if your, uh, what God is calling you to do is small. He said, it's too big. And what I don't understand, this is the challenge. He's saying, David, your mission is now too big to run by faith. You have to have substance, not faith. But yet, what does the Bible say about faith? What does the Bible say about faith? Hebrews 11. Faith is the substance and evidence. So faith is the substance that we're standing on. This platform is faith, and I can jump on it, dance on it. If I were the choir, I'd sing on it. <laughs> Why? Because it's substance. Faith is as solid as this. It's the evidence. Now, I talk about the miracle of getting out of the prison, the miracle of being healed from cancer twice. Do you know, I, I don't know, I, I, I don't know if there's any living man 
who's seen as many miracles as I see. You've only got to read the book, Why Siberia? And I'd recommend you do read it. Because you know that book is the most amazing story. It is literally the story of three months in Siberia. Now, we went there with 400 people with no money. And the amazing thing is, if they're saying to me now, David, you can't live by faith, when I announced that we were going to take 400 people to Siberia for three months, and I had no money, everybody said, you can't do it, it's impossible. I said, it's going to cost two million pounds. They said, it's impossible, you can't do it. But the thing is, I went and God supplied. God met every need, God paid every bill. And the fact is that today, uh, within one year, you couldn't do it again. The whole situation in Russia, the whole situation in Siberia had changed. When I first started going to Russia, why did I go? Because God spoke to me in the 1980s, and God said, the Iron Curtain will open. Nobody believed it. God said the Iron Curtain would open. I began to preach on it, and held the conferences, and as a result, when the Iron Curtain opened, I, I was able to go. That's how my ministry went into Russia so far. But you see, God has spoken, and God did it. I believed it. And then you see, God warned me. He said the Iron Curtain won't remain open. And you know, for 20 years, people have said, the Iron Curtain, oh, it's gone. It can never come back. Communism is gone. Russia is defeated. You've got freedom. I want to tell you, just look at the news today. What's happening? All the countries I've been evangelizing in now are under threat. Where is one of the biggest trouble areas in the Ukraine yesterday? Donetsk. I've almost every one of those towns that you see in your newspaper where there's a Russian uprising, where people are being killed, where people are under threat, and the Russians are threatening to take the Ukrainian territory. Every one of those, wow, I've been there to evangelize. And when I look, I say, thank God, thank you, Lord, you sent me there. I've preached the gospel. I've called the people to repent. And whatever happens there, they had a chance. They can never get, get into eternity and say, we never heard. And God will say, I sent David Hathaway. You had a chance. Do you understand? But you know, I'm battling over Donetsk. The pastor from Donetsk came to visit me uh, just a few weeks ago in the middle of the trouble. He said, what can we do? He said, David, will you come to, back to the Ukraine? Will you come to Donetsk? I'm going to Donetsk the first week in June. Because that pastor says, in the crisis, everybody in Ukraine knows you. They will all come to listen. And you know, the amazing thing is this. I learned only last week from a Ukrainian pastor in London. I learned, he said, you know the trouble. He says, the churches are against each other. The Russian churches are against the Ukrainian churches. He said... The, the Russian churches listen to the Russian propaganda. They say that it, it, it's fascism in Ukraine. The Ukrainian churches are against the Russians because they're invading their country. There's only one person who can bring peace, and it's Jesus Christ. But why did God send me there? Why did I go in faith? And if you understand, God sent me to the Baltic countries. Why did God send me to the Baltic countries? Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia. They're under threat from Russia now. Demanding NATO troops. Our aircraft are patrolling the sky over the border for fear that Russia will invade Estonia or Latvia or Lithuania. But you know, we've seen the greatest revival in those countries. Hundreds of thousands coming to Christ, preaching the gospel. I ne may never be able to get back. Where am I going this year? I'm going to Poland. Poland is demanding 10,000 NATO troops because they have such a large border with Russia and they're afraid. 
I was there last year. We had 80,000. We're going this year. And one reason why they're challenging my faith is this. We went 18 months ago. We had 80,000 people. God paid the bills. But now when we look at, at what's involved, do you know what we're actually doing at this moment in Poland? We have 250 people working for us in Poland. They're evangelizing the whole country before we get there. They're stirring up the churches. The Catholics, the Protestants, the Evangelicals, all of them are being stirred up. And six months before we go, we're going there in September, we already have 603 busloads full booked to come to Katowice in September. 603 buses. And that's six months before we go. The cost is enormous. And the reason they're challenging me, we've already seen the budget. I'm sorry you're going to get the budget uh, Tuesday next week. The budget's over two million. And so people are challenging me and they say, how can you do it? How can you raise two million pounds? They say it's impossible. It's more than we thought. But I believe in God. Because if I can believe God that he could raise Jesus from the dead, and if, if God can forgive my sin and change and transform my life, nothing is impossible with God. And you see, I know how short the time is. You see, the European Union was set up to stop war in Europe, but they didn't reckon with Russia. And the threat now is Russia is seeking to take back all its territory that it lost. And it's threatening the West. And they were meeting in Geneva yesterday. And what was the outcome of the talks in Geneva? Oh, they're saying, we'll solve it by diplomacy. And Putin says, and I reserve the right to send my army into the Ukraine. That's what he said. So is there peace in Europe? No. We've got to preach the gospel. How long have we got? How long have we got to win people for Christ? But it's the challenge to go by faith. But the thing is this, when I look at my life, almost everything that God has directed me in has been a miracle. When I was in the prison, uh, uh, don't you think I complained? And I would say, well, God, why am I in the prison? You know, I, 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 my family are on their own. They've got no support. I've got three young children. I've got a wife. What's happening? Uh, here I am. I can only preach the gospel to the men in the prison. I can't reach the other people. Why am I here? What's wrong? But what God had done was God allowed me to be in prison. Why? So that instead of being an unknown Bible smuggler, when I came out of the prison with Harold Wilson, firstly, it was a miracle. Secondly, God had revealed it to me in advance. And thirdly, it opened the door for me to preach the gospel all around the world. And the reason that the Jews listen to me today is only because I was in that prison. If it had not been for that prison, they would not, they would not listen to me. And do you know what God is doing in Israel is a miracle. To see thousands of people, and pastor, you've been there. You've been in the meetings. To see thousands of people weeping their way into the kingdom. And I, I don't know if I told you the story that when I was there at the end of last year, I think it was in November, when I got in the taxi to go to the airport, the taxi driver, who knew nothing about the meetings, turned and said to me, he said, David, he said, why? He said, why did we kill him? I said, what do you mean? Why did you kill him? We, did we kill him? You sure? And you know, the whole of the way to the airport, the taxi driver couldn't find the way because his head was turned round saying to me, the whole of Israel is asking the question, he was a good man, he worked miracles, he did nothing wrong, why did we kill him? 
And to me, the staggering thing about Israel today is that taxi driver is symbolic of Israel. Why did we kill him? Why did he go to death? But the, you know the answer. Why did he die to set you free from your sin? Why did the Jews reject him? Come on, why did the Jews reject him? So that the Gentiles could come into the kingdom. That's what the Bible says. The very rejection of Israel was God's plan. The very rejection by the Jews was God's plan to bring you into salvation. Without the Jews rejecting Christ, if two things had happened, if one, they hadn't killed him, there would be no salvation. If the Jews hadn't rejected him, we wouldn't enter into the kingdom. You see, God has a purpose. God has a plan. And the very Easter story is a picture of the plan of a God who knows the end from the beginning. Oh, hallelujah. And in your times of crisis, you've got to trust him. I've got to trust God now. I'm trusting God for two million, but God will supply. I'm trusting God to bring 150,000 people into the meeting this year. They say to me, if you do it this year, you can never do it again. No, I should be back next year, and this time we'll have a quarter of a million, half a million people. Why? Because we must evangelize Poland, and not only Poland, the whole of Europe, including Spain. And not only that, we've got to evangelize Britain. And I'm quite amazed because I feel that in England I've been rejected from evangelism. And yet now one of the Anglican bishops had lunch with me this week and paid for it, by the way. <laughs> and he said, David, we've got to work together in a program to reach Britain. You see, God is the God of the impossible. And whatever... God is calling you to do, that's impossible. If God can raise Jesus from the dead, you just look at what it says. Go turn back to Corinthians. Just for a moment, turn back to 1 Corinthians and see what it says in verse 15. In chapter 15, it says, in verse 11, in verse 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is vain and your faith is in vain. Paul is so explicit. If Christ is not risen, our very faith is meaningless. Our whole faith is based on the death and resurrection of Christ. That is the very center. And you know, that is one thing which the world cannot accept. They fight, they cannot accept the virgin birth. They explain it away. They cannot accept the resurrection. They explain it away. They say Jesus didn't die. They said he was unconscious. They said in the cool atmosphere he recovered. Oh yes, I've heard all the theories. But I know Jesus died and rose again. And he's coming back. And your whole faith is based on this miracle of the death and the resurrection of Christ. And if he can do that with Jesus, look what he can do with you in your life. Look, there's nothing impossible. Look what God can do. Look what God can do in my life, and I'm no different to you. I'm no different to you. As you know, I'm a twin. I'm a twin. And I, I always thought my parents favored my brother. He was the older. A little bit like Esau and Jacob. I always felt my, my parents favored my brother. He was the older. He was the stronger. He was the better man. Even my staff say, he's more of a gentleman than I am. <laughs> I won't add to that. <laughs> Why did God choose me? I don't know. I don't know. But I do know this, that all my life I trusted him. All my life I believed him. My brother doesn't. 
My brother lost his faith. My brother's wife died of cancer. My brother's oldest son was brutally murdered. Uh -huh. His only daughter is divorced. Her husband was an alcoholic. My family loved God and served God. What's the difference? I live by faith. I live by faith. I trust God for my family. I pray for my family. I've got a wonderful family. We were celebrating, of course, yesterday. And I just said, I thank God for my children and my grandchildren and my grandson who's getting married this weekend. <laughs> Why? Because we live by faith. We live by faith. Because faith in my life is the substance by which I live. It's the evidence by which I preach. Do you understand? How can I dare to go to Poland? You know, some people wanted me to cancel Poland this year. When they saw how the budget was escalating, how the cost of the buses was going up, and how we're having difficulty in finding uh, tents, shelter big enough to shelter uh, 150,000 people. Where do you get some structure that, we'll, that we can preach in that's going to protect them? We, we have rented the largest park, the largest public area in Europe. We're having to fence it off. It's costing us a fortune to enclose it. The security is horrendous. The sound systems, the light systems, you know all the technology is horrendous. It's 100,000 here, 100,000 there, a quarter of a million here. The buses are going to cost us three, 400,000. We're expecting not 603, we're expecting more than a thousand buses coming from all over Poland. Uh -huh. How do we do it? If we don't go by faith, nothing happens. When I look back and people said to me, don't go to Siberia in 1994 when I went, they said, don't go. You need to spend two or three years preparing. You need to raise all the money. I said, God told me to go now. We went, and the next year it was impossible. We've evangelized the whole of Russia, literally from one side to the other, so strongly, and this people don't understand what we've done in Russia. We've reached 80% of Russians with the pure gospel, with the call to repentance on their own state national TV, not satellite, state TV. So much so that even in the Kremlin, they know who I am. The KGB treated me to lunch. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes, they paid. Don't worry. <laughs> they could afford it. <laughs> and I said to the KGB in St. Petersburg, I said, look, if I come back and evangelize in St. Petersburg, will you do to me what you do to the American evangelists? What do they do to them? Oh, we've got religious freedom in Russia. Take the biggest stadium, pay all the money, do all the advertising. Then a week before... They say there's a bomb threat, and you can't use it. And then they switch them in. I've been there. They switch them into a tiny one that's only room for a few believers. So I said, are you going to play the same trick on me if I come to St. Petersburg to evangelize? Uh-huh. I said, are you going to play the same trick on me? And they said, they said, David... Two-thirds of the KGB are opposed to you. One-third will support you. I said, thank you very much. <laughs> you see? They will support. They won't stop me. Why is it that I'm the only person in the world that has a 12-month multiple-entry visa to preach the gospel in every, it's a religious visa, to preach the gospel in every town, village, and city in the whole of Russia. Nobody else has this. 
and is issued by the Russian government. Why? Because I go by faith. Because I go by faith. And you know what the Bible says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And you know, I hear people saying, oh, I want to please God and do this. Yes, you can please God in many ways, but without faith, you don't reach the heart of God. Trust Him. And you know, what is faith? It's, trust, it's trusting Him. And so I shall go to Poland. We will have 150,000 this year in Katowice. And yes, God will pay the bills. And the amazing thing is, since I stood in faith, and I asked people to pray, and if any of you get our newsletters, and know that a few weeks ago, I was saying we desperately needed 300,000. Some of you saw that newsletter. And people since have asked me, did God answer? Did he give the 300,000? I'll tell you what God gave. Through our donors from the mailing list, you gave 200,000. And a German businessman gave a million euros. You see, people say it's impossible. And they question because they didn't believe that God could give me, in that month, that God could give me 300,000 pounds. God gave me 300,000 pounds and the remainder of a million euros. A million euros is about 800,000, so in actual fact, God gave me the 300,000 plus another 700,000. So in actual fact, God gave me one million pounds. Do you understand? God called us to live by faith. And when I'm talking to you, let me just tell you very simply. I'm not just preaching to you. I am living by the faith I'm talking about. Forty years ago, I built the house by faith. I stepped out by faith. I went to Siberia by faith. God paid the bills. God provided my house. God provided a million a few weeks ago. The total cost is two million. God will pay the two million. God will provide. But you know, the amazing thing is this. People say to me, David, why do you live at such extremes? You know, why, why, why can't you be like an ordinary person? I mean, that's what they always say. They say, why can't you live like ordinary people do? You know, and work within your budget. You know, work within your budget. Do what you can do. I'll tell you one reason why I don't. Because if I live within my budget and I do what I can do, God doesn't get the glory. But if I set out to do the impossible and say, only God can do it, I can't do it, only God can, I want to live by faith in God, God gets the glory. And that's what you're singing, isn't it? Isn't that what you've been singing? Give God the glory. Give God the glory. Not man, we can't do it, I can do nothing. I can't forgive sin, I can't heal the sick. People are quite shocked because I stand up in front of the congregation and I say to 10, 15,000 people, I say, I can't heal you. I'm not going to lay my hands on you. I'm not a healer. Only God's a healer. Only Jesus can heal you. Ask him. And when they pray to Jesus and ask him to heal them, you get three, four, five thousand 5,000 miracles in one meeting. And it's normal to see one third or 50 percent of all the people there miraculously healed and those healings are so substantial their testimonies are so real and when we meet the people afterwards their testimony is a thousand times bigger than anything we could imagine what god is doing even in healing miracles is phenomenal for this generation 
absolutely phenomenal. Take Anton, the story of Anton now in Israel. I used to tell that story when he told me the whole story, 10 times bigger than anything I knew. The man who was dying, the boy rejected by his church because he was a backslider. Uh, 18, 20 years old, dying in that hospital, a criminal in prison, a drug addict, an alcoholic in a prison hospital. And God met him when I went into that hospital. God met him, totally healed him, saved his leg from being amputated. God's taken him to Israel, and he's serving, worshiping God in Israel. But that's only one of thousands of testimonies. The blindness, the tumors, the young man who came to me in England and said, I'm blind in one eye. I said, why? He said, when I was a boy, I swung a hit fish hook, uh, fishing, and the fish hook went in my eye, and I can never see, I'm blind. And he said, pray for me. I said, no. I said, sit down, watch the miracles. You've got no faith. Watch God heal the others. He watched them being healed one by one. He was the last, and God instantly healed his eye. The boy who stood on the platform in Russia, God had healed his eye, and his mother was sitting in the front, and she shouted out. She said, it's a lie. It's not true. It's my son. He can't see. He was born with no retina on the back of his eye. How can you say he can see? And the mother came on the platform arguing, her son, I know you. You're lying. You're lying. He said, Mama, I was born blind, but now I see your blue dress. I see your, your, your golden hair. I see your eyes. She broke down and threw her arms around him and wept. As only mothers can weep at the power of God. Why do the government in Lithuania send, ask me to go last Christmas, offer me the largest auditorium in the country free of charge? Why? Because three years ago, when I told the people, Call on God and he will heal you. A member of the government, skeptical there to criticize, said, I didn't believe. But when David said, put your hand where the problem is and call on Jesus, I was grossly overweight. I put my hand on my stomach and I prayed and the miracle happened. My trousers fell off. <laughs> he lost 20 kilos and he's a member of the government. And you know what the first reaction of the government was? David, come back and preach to us. We've got so many sins, we want to meet you in private. And they took the, the Catholic cathedral and invited 800 people and had the National Orchestra and Opera Society. And I preached Christ. Why? Because the evidence is there that God worked miracles. You understand? I would say almost everything in my life today happens as a result of a miracle. Whether it's my healing from lung cancer, my healing from throat cancer, everything that I do, I do by faith that Jesus was raised from the dead. And if God can raise Jesus from the dead, he can change your life. He can forgive your sin. He can solve every problem. He can make you into the greatest evangelist on the face of the earth. Yes, he can take any one of you. If you would just surrender yourself in faith and say, Lord, have your way in my life. That's the difference between me and my twin brother. Because all those years ago, I know the moment when I said, Lord, have your way in my life. Take everything. God never called me to be an evangelist. He never called me to be a pastor or a preacher. All he said to me was, David, I want you. I want everything. And I was only 15 years old. And I said, here you are, Lord, take everything. Yes, he's taken everything. Oh yes, there have been times when he's taken everything, but he gives back. And when he takes, 
he gives back not tenfold, a hundredfold. And I'll tell you something. I'll tell you something, and I've never mentioned this in public before. I never forget at my own wedding, and it's my grandson's wedding this weekend, at my own wedding, I chose the main song. And do you know what it was? Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to you. Take my moments, take my days, take me. Even at my wedding, I was giving myself not just to my wife, but to my Jesus. Doesn't the scripture say that you and I are to be the bride of Christ? And I'm going to remind them of that this weekend, that just as my grandson and his lovely girlfriend get married, that's the relationship between Christ and the church. And what do you do in the wedding? You give everything, don't you? All my worldly wealth, thee I endow. Uh-huh. You've been married once? <laughs> Have you ever come to a time when you can say that to the Lord? Lord, I want to give you everything. I want to give you everything. It's Easter. Let's come afresh to the Lord. Let's bow for a moment in prayer. Father, you know that precious moment when I was a boy of 15 and I stood on the seashore at Brighton and I said, Lord, Take everything, take my days, my, my, my life, take everything that I have and everything that I am. And you know full well that 50 years later I went back and I said, Lord, I want to thank you that you took my life and I want to give it to you again for the next 50 years. Father, just touch our hearts. Help us to rejoice in death. Because death is the door to life. Oh God, help us to rejoice in the fact that we're dead to sin, dead with Christ. Our sin is buried, it's gone. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you sent Jesus. Thank you because he had enough faith to live and to die. Oh God, give me the gift of faith every day that I live. Oh God, there's one gift I ask from you I've been asking for 69, 70 years, 69 years. I've been asking for one gift above every other and it is the gift of faith. Oh God, today give me a new gift of faith to face the challenge that I'm facing. Give these people a gift of faith to offer themselves to you tonight in sacrifice. Oh, Father, how many of you can hear God speaking to you? And you've got enough faith to say, Lord, I'm going to give you everything. Make me what you want me to be. If you will, just stand for a moment and I'll pray for you. Oh, I thank God for that moment when as a 15-year-old I said, Lord, I want to give you everything. I give you my life, I give you everything. Little did I know that sometimes you take my family when I was in prison. Sometimes you almost took my life. You've taken all my money, you've taken everything. But oh God, when you take, you give back a hundredfold. Father, I pray that these people might understand that love and that faith to enable them to give themselves afresh to you. And Father, I just pray that you would take their lives and make something of their lives. Oh God, in Jesus' name, make something of their lives right now. Oh God, change the course, change the direction, change the purpose 
And Father, give them the faith to know that when trials and temptations come, even cancers and sicknesses and imprisonments, that once our life is given to you, it's all part of your plan, that out of it all you're going to get the victory, just as with Jesus. Death was the greatest victory ever known. The death of Jesus was the greatest victory. Why? It not only brought our salvation, but defeated the power of the devil himself. What defeated the devil? It was the death of Christ because he didn't stay dead and he conquered death. And oh God, if you can conquer death, you can conquer the power of the devil in our lives. Heal our sicknesses. Oh God, heal our sicknesses. Open blind eyes. Unstop deaf ears. Take away pain. Heal every cancer. Heal every sickness. Solve every financial problem. But oh God, through it all, teach us to walk by faith. Teach us to walk by faith. Trusting you just as Jesus had to trust you to the cross. And when they said, and when you said, you could call legions of angels to deliver you from the cross. You could have called angels and you could have stepped down from the cross. They challenged you, step down from the cross. Come down. If you are the Son of God, come down off that cross, don't die. And you said, Father, into your hand I commend my spirit. Teach us today to commend our life and our spirit into your hands. And Father, I want to say to you, I give my future into your hands. I give you Poland and that evangelism. I give you Donetsk. And I shall be there in June. Oh God, I don't know how. It's a commitment. I've said I'm going. Oh God, I know that you will bring peace. You'll make it possible. And because of this warfare, that thousands of people will come to hear the gospel of salvation. Oh God, through tragedy, bring triumph. Through despair, bring hope. Through death, bring life. Through sickness, bring health. Through pain, bring deliverance. When the devil comes, let us in the name of the Lord rebuke him just as Jesus did. And, oh God, give us a sense of victory today because this is a celebration. Not Sunday, that's to come. But today is the day of celebration because Jesus did not stay dead but is alive. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Let's remain standing.